Welcome to worship. Um, who thought we would be so kind of out of sorts with Gary gone? But uh, he's not here tonight. And so Pastor Mike is, uh, is, is helping us along. So pray for him. Uh, we'll have someone to pick on if we don't sound good. I want to just say a, a welcome to all those that are joining us uh, with Facebook Live. We're thankful for your time with us in worship. We pray God's blessing to you. We continue to consider the desolation uh, that life can bring. And then the reality of Christ living in that calamity, He Himself who suffered and died. And then living in the consolation of who our Savior is. And tonight the desolation that comes our way often is when we're weak. And we all have weaknesses. We all have moments in life when um, we feel drained and weak. And as we uh, worship tonight, we'll know that uh, when we are weak, Christ is our strength. So may your faith be strengthened as we gather around God's Word tonight. Let's stand and call our hearts to worship. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you. In this world, you will have tribulation. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Let's sing, Lamb of God. The desolation that life brings, 
in our weakness from Psalm 102. Hear my prayer, Lord. Let my cry come to, for help come to you. Do not hide your face from me when I am in distress. Turn your ear to me when I call. Answer me quickly. For my days vanish like smoke. My, burn, my bones burn like glowing embers. My heart is blighted and withered like grass. I forget to eat my food. In my distress, I groan aloud, and I am reduced to skin and bones. I'm like a desert owl, like an owl among the ruins. I lie awake. I've become like a bird alone on a roof. All day long, my enemies taunt me. Those who rail against me use my name as a curse. What picture came to your mind as you heard the words of Psalm 102? I picture someone who is totally beaten down. It's almost pathetic. You picture suffering, great suffering. Suffering to the point that making it through a day is almost more than he can accomplish. His body is weak, broken down, and he seems frail. This person is miserable nearly hopeless, and suffering terribly. Now, some think that David wrote this psalm at the time of Absalom's rebellion. Others think it was Daniel, Nehemiah, or some other prophet who wrote it for Israel when it was in captivity in Babylon. Perhaps the writer was suffering some physical affliction. For our purposes tonight, the who and the why of some Psalm 102 really doesn't matter. My question for you this evening is this. Is there anything in your life today causing you pain or weakening your spirit? If not today, has there been anything in the past? Recent circumstances of life have weakened many of us. It could be the result of COVID-19 being virtually locked down in our houses and not being able to spend time with family and friends the loss of a job, a relationship, or a loved one, or even concerns about the state of our economy, our country, or the world. Any of these can weaken our spirit. They can weigh on us day after day until we might find ourselves in a state like the psalmist. The question then might be, who is this God that allows us to lose our strength and find ourselves so weak? Either he doesn't, doesn't care or he's incapable of doing anything about it. Difficult times present a problem for us. We know that our lives are just not a random event after random event. This is God's world. He made the universe and beyond and everything in it. He hasn't abandoned us. Jesus reminds us of this in Matthew 10, verse 29 where he says, not even a sparrow will fall to the ground apart from the will of your Father. Friends, I don't know why we have to endure suffering and pain. I do know that at one point or another, we're all going to encounter it. We are all called to accept it and endure it. However, I also know that we are not bound to enduring it alone. Suffering is a bad thing. As Christians, we are not some kind of masochists looking to deal with pain just to impress God. We can't simply write off pain and suffering. We can't simply call evil good. Look to God for help. He has healing gifts in his word and in the holy sacraments. I know that when I am at my weakest, when my faith is dwindling, God is with me and will be with me through, our, through my pain 
and promises that one day every tear will be wiped away and all things will be made new. Jesus joins us in our weakness. He helps us shoulder the pain and walks alongside us. He cares about you. He loves you and he hurts right along with you. He provides us with hope. Listen now to the words from the 15th chapter of Mark. For Mark chapter 15. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. Then they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified him. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, so you're going to destroy the temple and build it in three days? Come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. Some Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus, saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the Son of God. The cross. The cross. Somehow, I think the horror and the beauty of the cross is being lost today. We all have friends who seem to be, to be over Jesus' death and resurrection. They view the events as not unnecessary, as folklore, as being totally out of step with the all-inclusive 21st century God. Friends, we never want to be over his death and resurrection. We want him to shape us and encourage us through it. A death by crucifixion was one of the cruelest and most degrading forms of punishment ever conceived by human perversity. Yet in the Roman world, crucifixion was one of the customary means 
of preserving public order. In the eyes of Rome, the crucifixion of Jesus was no big deal. For Christians, however, the cross of Christ is the focal point of the gospel. It is here that God dealt once and for all with the problem of human rebellion and made provisions for the salvation of men. The unique character of Jesus' suffering is that he went to the cross to fulfill his mission and bear the burden of divine judgment on us. Sin from eternity past to eternity future. The obedience he showed in submitting to the will of God reversed a pattern of disobedience that began with Adam and continues today. It is at the foot of the cross where Christ meets us and over and overcomes the alienation of men by taking upon himself the death and the wrath that we deserve for our rebellion and sins. It is at the cross where we can see how Jesus can relate to those things we face, face every day, that we endure and that weaken us. Pain. Jesus was beaten and flogged by the soldiers and he was whipped. Not with a whip like you might see today, but with straps that had sharpened pieces of bone woven in them. Straps that at each time they hit Jesus, tore flesh from his body. The blood loss was tremendous. His body was weakened. The spikes of the cross, somewhere between five and seven inches long, driven into his hands. Imagine the pain from each blow of the hammer. Archaeologists tell us today that some victims of crucifixion had spikes pounded through their wrists. More nerve endings, more pain. And through the feet, through the heels, making it just that much harder and that much more painful to hoist himself up to grab a struggling breath. Yes, Jesus knew physical pain. He can relate to ours. How about the crowds? Mocking, jeering. Think Jesus knows about bullying? About how it feels to be that person nobody wants anything to do with? That person who has rumors started about them? Untrue accusations thrown at them? the sorrow and the pain that words can inflict, Jesus has experienced it all. Then there are the apostles. Where are they? One of them betrayed Jesus and the others simply scattered. Men Jesus had spent virtually every hour with for three years. Men he had fully invested himself into. Men he loved and who loved him, nowhere to be seen. When Jesus needed a friendly face in the crowd, none was to be found. Friends totally turning their back on him in his last hours. Jesus understands the pain we feel when friends or family disappoint us. Then the cry, with all of his strength, Jesus cries out, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Sorrow and pain just seem to drip from those words. It's hard to understand in what sense Jesus was forsaken by God. It is certain that God approved of his work. It is certain that he, Jesus was innocent. He had done nothing to forfeit God's favor. He was holy, undefiled, and obedient. God still loved him. In none of these senses could God have forsaken him. The prophet Isaiah tells us about the Messiah in chapter 53. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. 
Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced by our transgressions. He was crushed for our inequities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Jesus was made a sin offering. He died in our place on our account. I believe that served to intensify his sufferings and is at least part of the reason he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It tells us how much God hates sin. So much that his own son would be called upon to endure, endure so much pain, so much sorrow as to believe his loving father had disowned him in the midst of this terrible hour. Let's stand together now and sing, What Grace Is This? What grace is this, my Lord and King, has saved his face to suffer me, my God, consolation of Christ from Hebrews chapter 4 for we do not have a high priest who's unable to empathize with our weaknesses but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are yet he did not sin let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. These verses from the book of Hebrews makes clear 
that Jesus is our great high priest. To sort of put that into context, let's consider for a moment that which is known as the office of Christ, or the threefold office of prophet, priest, and king. The small catechism tells us that as prophet, Christ preached personally during his life on earth, validating his words with miracles, especially his own resurrection. As priest, he fulfilled the law perfectly in our stead, sacrificed himself for our sins, and still pleads for us today with his heavenly Father. Again, he still pleads for us with his heavenly Father. Finally, as king, Christ rules with his almighty power over creation and governs and protects especially his church and leads his church to glory in heaven. Jesus fills each of these roles for us. The book of Hebrews seems to focus a great deal on Jesus' role as high priest, our sorely needed high priest. Do you ever wish you had someone to talk to? Someone who would understand the challenges you face at any given moment? But maybe as you think of all your friends and family, and perhaps even your pastors, it seems there is no such person with whom to share. Sure, there are plenty of folks who are compassionate and wise, who will give you a hug or an encouraging word, but there is no one for you to go to to have that intimate talk or cry that your heart desires and needs. Who really knows and fully understands what you're going through? Jesus, our high priest, is that someone? He perfectly understands what we are going through and what we need at any given moment because he's been there. Again, in our passage, we are told that because Jesus was tempted in every way as we are, and as a result, he can sympathize with our weaknesses. Accordingly, we can approach God with boldness, knowing that he will meet with us and he will meet us with grace and mercy. Through Christ's blood, we have access to the Father. However, what if that access only found God to be someone high and mighty, king type who reigned over everything from a distance, who couldn't, be, who couldn't directly connect with us? It would be an honor to be in his presence, but it wouldn't be an intimate encounter. The good news for us tonight is that that is not at all the case for us. When we come before the, our king's throne, he is thrilled to meet us there. He has extended an invitation. Come, draw near. He has told us to come boldly with confidence because he knows and understands what we're going through. He knows because he himself endured everything we will ever face, and he can relate to our needs firsthand. Now, finally, we are told in verse 16 that we will be met with mercy. That means that we will be met with a sympathy and an understanding that is expressed by helping someone, not just passively interested, but actively involved and willing to jump right in the middle of whatever is going on and helping us. That is the kind of savior we have. The French poet and theologian Paul Claudel once said, Jesus did not come to explain away suffering or to remove it. He came to fill it with his presence. Tonight, Jesus invites us. He gives us the right to come boldly. He understands our needs, and he will respond with love and compassion. 
He is our strength when we are weak. They thought they had put an end to Jesus when they hung him on the cross. Thanks be to God that our prophet, priest, and king is here with us tonight and with us always. Amen. Won't you please stand as we pray? Lord Jesus, we thank you from the depths of our being for your wondrous grace and love in bearing our sin in your own body on the tree. May your cross be to us as a branch that blossoms with life and beauty. By your cross you crucify our every sin. Use it to increase our intimacy with you. Make it the ground of all our comfort, the joy of all our duties, the sum of all your gospel promises, the comfort of all of our afflictions, and the basis of all our love and thankfulness. You have also appointed a cross for each of us to carry, a cross before you give us a crown. You have made it our portion, but our carnal being hates it. Without your gift of the grace of patience, we cannot bear it, walk with it, or profit by it. Teach us, gracious Lord and Savior, that with our crosses, you send promised grace so that each of us may bear it patiently and that each of our crosses is your yoke, which is easy, and your burden, which is light. In the name of our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Our closing song is My Faith Looks Up to Thee. So go now with his peace, and as we go, we go with this declaration. Sorrow gives way to joy. Weeping gives way to laughter. Death gives way to life. Despair gives way to hope, because he is alive. Amen. Have a good night, everybody.